All right, YouTube, it's time for occult video number 20, the big 2-0 in the occult lecture series, Conceptions of Satan. Um, I've covered this partially before. I've spoken about Satan many times, usually in the context of other videos. Uh, I wanted to finally dedicate an entire video to this somewhat important topic because I think that a lot of people have many misconceptions about what you call the devil, Satan, Lucifer, um, any of these figures. And the first thing that I'll have to do, of course, is once again differentiate because there is a difference between when we speak about the authentic version of the devil versus the sort of ever-changing concept of Satan as well as the concept of Lucifer, which is totally different. Uh, these three, th three sort of figures, these three sort of names have to be differentiated before anything else can be said. Uh, as regards, this video will be predominantly about the idea of Satan <clears throat> in the Judeo-Christian sense and the various interpretations, figures that have been used to, you know, sort of demark this being. Uh, as for the differentiation thereof, though, um, these three figures not being the same often get drawn together. That is, the average person, the average Judeo-Christian, the average person who believes, yes, Jesus is my savior, or, you know, I follow the, the teachings of Moses or whatever, uh, the average individual thinks that the three names represent the same being. But if you go back, you can find Lucifer refers, metaphorically, I would say, to the fall of Satan. And that's essentially the only time in which Lucifer is referring to that story within the context of the Bible, within the context of the New Testament. The original Greek was translated to Latin and Phosphoros <clears throat> became Lucifer. Lucifer is not a proper noun. It is not a name. It is a description which can be applied almost anything. The bright and morning star, the day star, um, or, or essentially illumination in a general sense, literally giving off light. So I've, I've pointed out before a flashlight is Luciferian on, on the idea that it gives off its own light. However, within the New Testament, when the term Lucifer is used, it's referring to Jesus falling to earth uh, or falling down into hell for a limited period of time before the resurrection and so forth. This is where that term is used, proving, again, it's not a proper noun. It's not actually referring to Satan, although I do believe it is used to refer to Satan in one passage. It's also used to refer to Jesus. And it's also used to refer to a dead Babylonian king. Can't remember the name of the specific king. Uh, the devil <clears throat> is also not Satan. The devil as used within Judaism cannot be the same figure that's used within the New Testament because the Jews, of course, expunge the New Testament, don't believe in its content largely. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And they don't believe in the context of revelation. So the Satan that we're seeing there with the attendant beast and dragon and antichrist is not the same being that the Jews were referring to in the Old Testament. The devil of the Old Testament is really more of a trick, uh, trickster, a tempter, and what Christians in the modern age would consider just a rudimentary demon. In fact, the term devil could be used in a, a less personable sense. That is, there wouldn't be just one you know, overarching you know, uh, uh, anti-archangel enemy of mankind, and that's the devil. No, there are multiple devils that they're speaking of. They would be equivalent to the Islamic term jinn. Um, and that's where the devil is used. The devil is, is quite literally a little serpent winged thing that tempts people and tries to get them to fall short. The only mention of Satan that you see authentic mention of, of the main sort of enemy of mankind, as the Christians would term it, is in the book of Job, where Satan, again, is shown in a totally different light from, you know, in Revelation or something like that. Satan there is seen as, first and foremost, attending a meeting of the angels with their god, which seems rather strange because you've almost got a pantheon set up rather than a monotheism because God is... I guess talking with all of these other angels and speaking about various plans and talking, I'm um, you know, drawing up battle plans or you know planning temples or something. 
So first, you've almost got a polytheistic feel to this specific story. Satan in this story is essentially making a wager with God, um, a fairly innocuous behavior, and has to get the go-ahead from God himself in order to do anything. That is, that Satan didn't simply decide, well, I'm going to be an idiot, and I'm going to be mean to people, and I'm going to start torturing them and taking their things away and burning their homes down and, and having their daughters carried off by you know pagans or something. Satan doesn't do that. Satan goes to God, observes Job, and says, well, yeah, of course he's holy because you've given him everything that he could possibly ever want. He has no reason to be unholy. You know, he has no reason for fear because he's got everything. He's got no reason for jealousy because he's the richest man. Take all that away from him uh, and let me do that, of course, for you as, as a servant of this same God within the context of the story of Job and, in fact, the entire Old Testament. And that's when Satan gets the go-ahead to do mean things. But it's at, the, it's at the behest of God. It doesn't happen because Satan says, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go and torment these people for no reason because they happen to be holy. That doesn't appear until the New Testament times. Now, <clears throat> as for the conceptions of Satan itself, and you, you would have to say itself because you've got various... Um, it's almost a chimera of different things that get thrown in over time. As for the nature of Satan itself, or himself, or herself, or themselves, depending on who you ask, apparently. In the early antiquated period, Satan is best represented in most texts, in most inscriptions, in most art pieces, in most pieces of discourse as being roughly similar to that same devil from the Old Testament. That is, it's not even clear always that it's singular, um, or all-powerful, or immortal, or anything like that. It's essentially a winged serpent, a desert demonic spirit. That is what Satan is referred to in these older works. Or conversely, in a more authentic sense, as being one of those same angels attending the Lord Jehovah, or whatever, uh, however you would like to term Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, whatever, uh, being an attendant force, being an attendant angel, a high archangel, second only to God, or possibly third behind the archangel Michael, depending on, again, who you ask. And those are the two sort of visions of Satan that are given around this time. It isn't until the medieval period, the early, like, Dark Ages, that we get a switch. Uh, Satan goes from being essentially a winged serpent with sort of, generally speaking, the wings of, of like a, a raven or an angel, as you might term them, a sort of man-like body, and a long serpentine tail. And, and it makes sense because the original term for this adversary within the Judaist lore is quite literally a winged serpent. Um, so it makes it makes sense. Of course, it's anthropic. It's, it's given sort of the characteristics of a human being, I guess, to make it more personable. But that specific aspect of Satan uh, also doesn't appear in the lore. It's literally a serpent with wings. We're talking about, as in a snake flying through the sky, what we would consider similar to a dragon. Uh, and the term dragon is, of course, then used in Revelation, possibly wrongfully based on those old texts uh, without knowing the actual Hebrew behind them. In the medieval period, Satan changes. Satan goes from being essentially either, either the angel attendant that's just tempting people and working for God, or the ultimate evil enemy that's also like a dragon, to being what we recognize as the more stereotypical Satan, that is, the little goat man with sort of leathery skin, or we could say red skin, representing the fires of hell, of course, let's not kid ourselves, holding a pitchfork, having the long sort of tail. The tail appears to be a vestigial remark on the original sort of serpentine tail from the older period. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't really matter or figure in, and it's not always present. But what is almost always present are the horns of a goat, the hooves of a goat, sort of a pan-like body, and this trident, this, this sort of pitchfork, the prongs that he carries around. The pitchfork appears to appear from the same source that the goat-like features do. That is, what you've got is a mixing of Pan and Hades. Uh, Hades or Pluto within, within the Roman pantheon, the Romanized pantheon of the Greeks, because they're basically the same with different names. 
these two pagan spirits were drawn together for a willful reason. Pan represented sex, music, enjoyment, partying, taking life easy, not, not worrying about the rules too much, essentially being a heathen, which was seen as sinful by the church at the time. Hades, or Pluto, represents death, so what better way to represent Satan than to take the aspect of materialistic styles of enjoyment, which, which the church proclaimed as sinful and evil and everything wrong with the world, mix them together with the idea of death, and make Satan out of them. That's simply what happened. The, the depiction of Satan, within the literature and the art anyways, is of this same figure, this pan-like figure with some aspects of the Lord of Death. And, and sometimes he's depicted more monstrously than others. In the Renaissance, you've got a similar Satan oftentimes, not always, but you've got generally the similar look to Satan, but then the aspect changes. It's not so much the view of Satan that changes, so much as the the idea about what Satan represents changes. In the medieval period, it's Satan leads you to hell. You will burn forever. Satan tries to teach you witchcraft. Satan tries to get you to do all of these things. In the Renaissance period, when you start getting some of these grimoires, especially, Satan is then seen, because of the dragging in of apocryphal writings, it seems, as a force that can potentially not only be bargained with, you know, sort of the selling your soul to Satan idea, but can also be quite positive, that is, can be controlled to do good if you're capable of binding Satan as a sorcerer or an occultist of some manner. <clears throat> and this isn't the only thing that changes, because remember that around this time, in this sort of colonial era, we're talking about the late 1400s into the 1500s, the settlers and colonists begin arriving in the Americas. What do they encounter? They encounter Native Americans who have a tale called the Manitou. Now, the Manitou is sort of regarded as serpentine as well, although it has like a boar's or a goat's head, and it must have looked a lot like the inscriptions of Satan that Christians would have been used to from, from what then would be the older period, the antiquated period, but they would still have been familiar with certain of those art pieces. When they encountered this, they literally declared it the devil and thought that the devil was residing in the Americas in some of these bodies of water. And there was an elaborate story that comes later, after this sort of Renaissance period, when, they begin, when they've begun forcibly converting people, um, about a man who was a drunk. I can't remember the name of the story, but the man is basically a drunk, and he goes to the Manitou, which is Satan, obviously, and it's a bit like a Faustian bargain in the sense that he, he essentially gives his soul to Satan in exchange for a money bag that never runs out of silver and a jug that never runs out of alcohol. Because he's a drunk, he's down on his luck, so he wants money and he wants alcohol. That's all he wants out of life. He makes the bargain, he gets what he wants, and then fairly so soon after that he dies. Um, and of course he goes to hell and it's sort of a cautionary tale and this is what we get around that period in, in essence a lot of the time Satan goes from being pure evil you're about to get burned at the stake as a witch to being cautionary tale don't do this because and you get sort of a creeping almost of, of what you would consider rudimentary logic into the same stories that were sort of used to just scare people now it was more appealing to their reason I guess in some ways and you've got the drawing together at this time of multiple cultures. A figure that had been largely European begins to take on some aspects of the American cultures among the Mesoamericans there. You get Islamic influence into some of these ideas. And in fact, some of these grimoires appear to reference possibly uh, some of these ideas within Islam or within traditionally Islamic regions as well as Judaism. You get that, by the way, in the Black Pullet, uh, which doesn't come until the mid-1800s. Yes, the, the sort of Napoleonic or post-Napoleonic era, but at the same time, I mean literally, it's the same content. We're talking about talismans and we're talking about Islamic influence into the idea of Satan or devils or demons in general. Satan in the Enlightenment period takes on a totally different aspect. Satan in the Enlightenment period had two aspects. First, he was sort of the suave intellectual 
hated by the church and by, you know, sort of the ignorant lay people and sort of represented the libertine qualities of the revolutionary period. But the revolutionaries, the intellectuals, sort of regarded Satan almost as an archetype, of, uh, an archetype of good rather than evil. And you get this later as well. You get even a more positive look at Satan. Satan may represent materialism and various bad things, but is not a completely malevolent force anymore. For the first time, around the time of the French Revolution and the American Revolution, Satan takes on that aspect of ruling over certain occult forces that are at the time intertwined with science, being involved with science in a general sense, being involved with intellectual pursuits, being involved, yes, with that same sexual sort of liberation quality of that time, you know, people having hookers and orgies and all sorts of things, drinking, partying, there's still that aspect of the pan-like features from the medieval era, but it's not as malevolent as before. Then, in the Romantic period, you get sort of the ultimate Satan, and it's, it's sort of the same Satan that's looked at today by some people that actually venerate Satan. That is, the Romantic Satan is a poetic Satan, and it's very anthropic. It's usually, usually this figure around this time is depicted as a very handsome man with long black wings and a sword and sort of Roman-style armor, and at this time, you've got to preface this, by realizing at this time, people are starting to dig into what we would consider primordial anthropology. They're digging around in ruins. They're trying to formulate, you know, sort of the origin of mankind. They're delving more into science. And so they have an appreciation for antiquated cultures. So they sort of depicted Satan at the time as being sort of almost looking like Alexander the Great with wings. And around this time Satan is seen as a poetic, a heroic figure, but a tragic hero. That is in the vein of sort of the ancient plays, sort of the Shakespearean quality, Satan is seen as a fallen hero that stood up to a tyrant god, was cast down, and now is basically, woe is me, I'm lost forever, and I have no friends, and I have no love, and everyone will hate me for the rest of eternity. Uh, that appears to be what Satan is generally regarded as around this time. Then in the sort of marginally modern period, we're talking about like the Roaring Twenties or the Depression, um, the early 1900s, the late, the wee hours of the 1800s into the early 1900s, we get a conception of Satan that's generally as being overly obsessed with material wealth and everything because as people move steadily in parts of the Western world particularly, towards more religious zeal, and they're sort of hurting for cash, and there's corruption everywhere. Satan takes on an aspect of being evil again, but he's a plutocrat. Satan is a big, fat, rich dude with lots and lots of gold. Um, and at the same time, you also get this same element that you had in the medieval era, uh, medieval era yet again, which is the little bony red-skinned dude who's playing tricks on people. But that Satan is actually less malevolent than the anthropic Satan used to sort of represent the, peop the elite, the people in power, and we still have this to this day. That Satan is very malevolent, it, it, concerned with grinding people down and corruption and generally being a, an idiot. The other Satan that's used around the time is almost uh, starts to become an advertising scheme, number one. Number two, isn't killing people, isn't causing people to go to hell, so much as causing people just to do stupid stuff. You know, literally, you'd have Satan throw a banana peel out in front of somebody to have them trip, and then Satan and all his demons are laughing their asses off. This is sort of the Satan that's used within commercial purposes at the time, and this is the same Satan, by the way, that's used today. Hell is no longer generally represented by any but the ultra-religious as being a real place of eternal torment and true horror and screaming and gnashing of teeth. Hell is more often seen in a funny light now, a satirical light, as being a, an almost amusing place to be. That is typically what you're depicting. You, the general depiction of hell and Satan today, and this goes into the, the modern and postmodern period, the general conception of Satan and hell today 
is either as a place where you would put people you disagree with, that is, political leaders you don't like, religious leaders you don't like, or whatever. The religious do this too. The Protestants talk about the Pope in hell. The Catholics talk about you know, Luther in hell or whatever, and they do the same thing as one another. Or you would depict it as being a party, basically, where all of your favorite stars are and all the celebrities are there and everyone's sweating and they're kind of in pain, but ultimately they're having a great time and they're partying it down. And they're, it's a dance hall forever. There's free drinks forever. Satan gets depicted as sort of a liberating biker figure sometimes. Um, you would have like uh, satanic imagery on uh, biker clothing and so forth. Which, which is no coincidence because it's, it's carrying that same Enlightenment era vein with it that it always did. Uh, it's drug related, definitely rock music related, metal related, and that's the Satan that's generally seen today. But the thing is, ultimately, there is no authentic Satan because this figure is so confused with so many other figures so many other names, so many other meanings and ideologies, and you've got so much overlap between these various ideologies all feeding into the same Satan, that the Satan that people believe in now will not be the same as the Satan they believe in a century from now. A hundred years from now, when, when I'm probably a corpse by that time, unless I happen to have a record-breaking lifespan, Satan will not be regarded the same way that Satan is regarded today as being that advertising figure slash, in the modern sense, a representation often of some shadowy elite that practices occultism and is trying to take over the world. Uh, this too is a passing phase in sort of the representation of this figure, which is not Lucifer and is not the devil. The, the main problem is those that have the strongest opinion about the nature, the goals, the beliefs, the desires, the hatreds and so forth and the acts of Satan are the same people who have the least idea about Satan's character, and this would be the hyper-religious New Age Christians, the Churchians, typically, uh, that regard Satan as being sort of the personification of all evil, but the evil that they see is not the same as the evil that was seen a thousand years ago, uh, or even a hundred years ago. They're, they're not aiming at, at, at plutocracy, they're aiming it at all governing structures, uh, some organized religious groups, occultism in a general sense, and just the general, what they see, what they, in their opinion, see as the decline of Western civilization away from, apparently, some Protestant glory, because it's largely Protestants which do this. And that's the problem, because uh, these individuals haven't really studied anything about it, they just get this from their pastors uh, and their, you know, their other spiritual leaders, their charismatic evangelical megachurch pastors basically tell them what Satan wants and what Satan looks like and what Satan has done. And very little of it is actually biblical. It's, it's just as biblical as any of these other conceptions of Satan over time, which is to say they are situational. They are locked within a specific historical period and Satan is generally used as one of two things. It's used either to demonify people you happen to dislike, that is, again, politicians you don't like, nations you don't like, religious forces you don't like, social forces you don't like. They're Satan or they're satanic, and so they're represented as such. Or it's used for satire. It's used for entertainment. It's used as a representation of something funny or something liberating or something antithetical to what you dislike. You may, you may, you may claim, for instance, if, if, a, if a person hates the Catholic Church, they may liken the Pope to Satan. Or they may say, well, Satan's the good guy and the Catholics got it all wrong. Either of these can be the case. And so you have these two sort of bizarre Satans running around that are completely opposite one another, and they're both used in public discourse to a great extent. And, and yet you can't argue that any of these conceptions are actually based on Judeo-Christian dogma. It's simply situational, and you would find different likenesses of Satan in different cultures through time. The Satan that is regarded as real by an American Protestant is not the same Satan that's regarded by a European Catholic as being real, or by somebody within the Orthodoxy, or somebody who practices Islam. Uh, these, these devils, these demonic figures, are totally, totally different things. The Satan of, of 
Central Africa or some other place or some upstart church in China is not going to be the same. It's the same as likenesses of Jesus. The Christians in the, in the early period of Christianity in Asia, Jesus somehow looks Asian. In Europe, Jesus looks European. In Africa, Jesus is black. You've, you've got Hispanic Jesus, you've got Eskimo Jesus, you've got all of these different Jesuses. You've got the same central figure, either real or mythological, but you've got different interpretations that are used. And they're styled that way so people can understand them more easily. You have the same thing with Satan. Satan goes from winged serpent slash sometimes a, a sort of giant with minuscule wings that chews on his enemy is constantly night and day and is, you know, trapped in some Dante's Inferno style hell where he's up to his waist in his own excrement. Uh, you've got the Enlightenment era, sort of the dapper dude with the top hat and the monocle smoking his cigarette. Uh, you've got the Romantic Satan, which is basically a Roman general or Alexander the Great with wings, um, sort of lamenting the fact that he was thrown out for doing what he thought was right. You've got all of these different Satans. And it would be difficult for anybody who actually believes in the figure to determine which Satan is correct and then to actually support it with dogmatic evidence because the Bible, and in fact the Jewish scriptures at large, say very little about Satan. There are only a few passing remarks about this. There, the extra-canonical Jewish scriptures that refer to the fall of Satan, again in, in translated form with the name Lucifer because of his attributes, are really the most expansive text you have and really it almost looks more like the romanticist style Satan than it does the the antiquated or medieval Satan that most people tend to refer to in their art or especially the modern Satan which you know people say well Satan is Lord of the Illuminati the NWO some reptilian alien race um, the Vatican the Rothschilds uh, various corporate entities various banks the British royal family uh, such and such and so and so these other you know celebrities music video makers Hollywood uh, this is all sort of thrown in and it's been thrown all into this same sort of conspiratorial Satan specifically because all of these things entertainment is seen as sinful by those who are hyper religious so is music in general film in general politics um, the Catholic Church the monarchist figures that happen to be wealthy Looks like a bee or something flying around. Uh, all of these different figures are seen as satanic. And so it all feeds into the attributes of Satan, as it has been for over 2,000 years. Um, this figure does not resemble the dogmatic Satan of the original scriptures. So yeah, just a little bit about Satan. I thought I would explain it more in depth because I've covered it before in a more limited detail, but I needed to add it to the occult playlist anyway, and I'm trying to keep everything properly like you know, categorized here. So yeah, um, Satan, uh, I kind of like the Romanticist Satan best, or the Enlightenment era Satan, because they appear to be the most, let, let's say, appropriate as far as describing what this figure truly represents in a metaphorical way. Uh, but you can't go wrong with a giant winged serpent. You also can't go wrong with the little goat man who just wants to cause people to have sex. Doesn't sound too malevolent to me. You know, drunken, sexy Satan is, that's a-okay with me. That's about all. <laughs> Peace out.